Dear students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I will speak here and try to explain a little bit the way we work, the way we work with others, the way we work interdisciplinary with others, and mostly I would like to show you some buildings I haven't shown so often, that haven't been published yet, or are just in the process of being designed or built. First, I need to briefly explain who we are. First of all, as you see, we are four partners, top right, Madler Blatt in Boston, Stefan Rappold in Stuttgart, Robert Hösle in Munich, and I in all the offices. We work mostly with young people right out of school who work with us for several years and then after a while move on. It suits us, it suits them, and even though it's sometimes a difficult process because once you have the feeling now they have understood what it's about, they move on and open their own office, which I think is good in the end for everybody. This is our Stuttgart office. And you'll see there, this is our Munich office. And this is our Boston office. We are all together about 100 people in these three locations, while Stuttgart is the biggest office the oldest, the most established, and the biggest office. Important to say is, we acquire our work mostly through competitive processes, either architectural competitions or what we call here, what you would call RFQ, we call it beauty contests. You know, you go to an interview and you try to convince you're the only one who really can do the job. It's fun, but I prefer more the architectural competitions where it's about what you actually can do and not what you claim you can do. But both ways are fine. What we do, we like innovation. We like every time to find a new edge on a building, a new idea, a new concept, a new highlight for us. Something that actually motivates us to go in the office in the morning. What is new? What is the potential in this project? We are a full service office. We are a German traditional office. We do design work, but we also do tender documents, we do all work drawings, we do construction management, multiple contracts, like the top right building is the Norddeutsche Landesbank in Hanover. We manage 180 contracts on site for a project like that for the clients. It's difficult, but on the other hand, you are in good control as an architect you are in control of the process and of the different trades. We work on innovation, sustainable systems, lighting systems. To the left bottom, that is with a porcelain factory in China factory in, in uh, Berlin, a new lighting system. To the right with Rolf Benz, a lounge chair furniture system and so on. We we are architects. We are not out there to design products. But often for our buildings, we have the feeling there is a gap, there is something missing. And then we try to develop these products accordingly. And in order to do so, we have to work very well with engineers, but also with companies, with product designers and developers in the factories in the companies themselves. 
Let me go to the aspect of sustainability. Now, sustainability is a well-used word right now. And it means something different for everybody. For a lot of people, it's just using a little bit less energy. I think that is a little bit short. If that would be right, if we would purely quantify sustainability and say it's kilowatt hours per square meter per year, or you have a different way to calculate it, if that were right, I could build a very sustainable building by doing it in a way that nobody uses it, so I save a lot of energy. That can't be it. So we have other aspects. And what are the other aspects of sustainability? There is the urban aspect. Then there is the aspect of the public realm. Then there is the aspect of social responsibility. Here, how do we balance the interests of all different members of society? Then the cultural aspect. If we, if we look at it, we'll see closely architecture is the most prominent human artifact you could imagine. Because if you think at any place on this world, man-made place on this world, you always think architecture. Think Istanbul. Think Paris, Rome, New York, Chicago. Always architecture. And not individual buildings, sometimes yet, but mostly public realm, atmosphere. So, architecture is a cultural asset. And we should never forget that. It's not a machine that minimizes on energy. Each building we build interferes with our environment. Just building a building, yeah? we are not sustainable. So in the end, the big question is, and we should never forget that, what has the building been worth it to be built? Was it worth it, the effort? So it's more than just pure energy. It's about well-being about serving a purpose, about a cultural contribution. And sometimes I think about, see, that's a library in Ephesus over there. Sometimes I think in 2,000 years or whatever, someone starts digging and finds the Staples Center. Can you imagine what they think about our cultural abilities? Or I could take any other building. So we should never forget that. Then the next thing is how responsible are we with materials? Do we, can we reuse them? How, are, how responsible do we treat nature? And now, only now, the last three ones are the ones we always discuss when we discuss sustainability. Air, climate, energy, daylight, artificial lighting. And often we don't even discuss daylighting. So you see, it's a very broad context, usually narrowed down by ourselves, by the architects, to only two, three, maximum four aspects of a whole world which can improve architecture. I'm starting with a project which we are right now designing. It's for Amherst College, a new science center. That was an RFP pro uh, process. And I don't know if anybody knows Amherst College. It's typical New England, East Coast, white fences, columns in front of the houses. You know, your typical New England project. And they have a, pro a building right now at Science Center which is way too big, very too inefficient. And they were looking for an architect who 
found a way to place that on the campus and we had to study different sites and still sort of let the campus live even though the building is size-wise too big. Here, it was not a, a competition in, a, in that way, it was a process of different architects being invited to do studies on different sites on the campus. And this is the family tree of our try and errors to find the right solution. And I have to say, we worked with the trustees of Amherst College and they have been very good, very brave. They always, always pick the most challenging design. And were willing to work with us on that. To the right, you see the existing building in orange. To the left, you see our approach. We were thinking or analyzing the campus and said, it's less about architecture. The architecture there is very mixed. It's about scale, about grain, scale of the buildings. When buildings get too big, they don't function in this campus. What assets do they have? They have a beautiful nature. They have these rolling hills. So if we have to build a too big building, it's easier for nature to cope with this, with a, for the landscape to cope with it, than for the architecture to cope with it. And so we developed the design of these landscape terraces built in the hill, and only the top part you see is visible above the hill as a building. And here, I'll go far, rather far through it. It's a science building for different disciplines. It was meant to be very interdisciplinary, very cooperative between the different uh, disciplines. And here are the different floors I'll jump through. And this is the, the top floor. That's the only floor that's exposed all around. The interior. The view over the landscape. We here, <laughs> the goal was to develop a building that minimizes energy consumption, like most of the times. But here, our goal was also to do it in a low tech manner. So we worked together with Transolar Climate Engineering, with the solar studies how far does the overhang in what direction have to be to cast shadow on the facade and with a light shelf get indirect light in the building and still cast shadow on the facade never have the facade itself exposed to daylight to sunlight it has different advantages first of all you keep the heat out and still have daylight in but secondly, architecturally very important, if a glass facade is in the shadow, it's very transparent. You don't see it. Only when it reflects, you see it. And so we made sure the facade is always in the shadow, not working with movable devices. Here are the offices, and that's, that's that's always a fight when we do new buildings and we have offices around the top perimeter. In Germany, we usually have very shallow floor plates. We say 12, maximum 15 meters, double loaded hallway. And so we have enough daylight. Here, we usually have deeper floor plates in the US. And so suddenly, if you have around the perimeter offices, Everybody who is sitting in the middle is cut off the daylight and cut off the view to the outside. So we provide glass office walls and here you get in a cultural battle all the time. They want privacy, they want it closed off. We think it's not socially acceptable to cut off everybody else. And so 
Only when we say, good, you want, you want closed offices? Fine. We put them in the middle and the open floor plan to the facade. Suddenly the glass office is not that big a problem anymore. Yeah? You just have to turn it around. And that's the lab areas. You see the rolling wall, the swinging wall. The write-up spaces are behind that wall, and behind that are the lab spaces separated by a glass wall. And here, that's a model. And you see the chimney? No. A lab building usually has all these chimneys on top for, the, for these exhaust fumes. Yeah? And big mechanical penthouses. Here we can't afford that because the top of our building is actually right on the level of the public spaces. We can't afford that. So we formed a roof where all the mechanical is hidden in the free-formed roof and have a solar chimney on top that helps ventilating the space, space naturally and also accel helps accelerating the exhaust fumes which you see here, the big four pipes are the exhaust fumes of the fume hoods. Now I'm, I'm moving away from US. Now I'm going, we are going to Hamburg. In Hamburg, we have done three projects. We have done first the house in house, which is, I'll show, in an existing old stock exchange and installation. Then we have done Unilever and Marco Polo Tower, and I'll start with Unilever in Hafen City. This is Unilever and the Marco Polo Tower in Hamburg, Hafen City. The terraces in front are done by Miraes. And to the right, you don't see it, is the um, Philharmonie, the Symphony Hall by Herzog and Demeron. This is the ground floor. Now, Unilever is a, is a Dutch company originally. It's their German, Swiss, Austrian headquarter here. And they are all very open. And they are very fresh. They are very hip. So when we read the brief for the competition the first time, it almost read like the brief for Montessori school or Montessori kindergarten. It's all open and it's all a big playground. No individual offices. And they actually did stick to that. Even the board of directors are on one floor, but no individual offices. It's all open. It's very uncorporate, but it's corporate on another level. Yeah. This is the office floors, and you see some individual offices. They are usually either, you know, finances or human resources. Then you have individual offices. Everything else is open floor plan. And in the middle, you have a play zone. And for example, the meeting rooms and meeting booths are in the middle, and they are soundproof. But the office itself is not soundproof. No suspended ceilings, all installation exposed here. The whole building is only LED lit, no other lighting in the building. These are these, you see them here. The yellow part are the communicative areas connected by bridges. And this is an example of these communicative areas. Floor, a deeper office. Along the facade, the perimeter, you have meeting areas, group working areas. Then you have regular individual working areas. And then you have, again, this play zone in the middle. And on top, again, individual. The sustainable concept, Unilever is 
relatively low energy. We have its lead platinum and DGNB gold. Now, the certification is one thing. I could do a pretty decent lead platinum building that is not very sustainable at all. And I could do a very sustainable building that doesn't even get lead silver. You know? So it's not all. It's a good checklist and it's a sign that someone thought about it. But it's not a self-purpose. But anyway, they wanted it, so they got it. We are here energy consumption in the realm of 85 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for light, heating, and cooling without any computers, printers, and everything. To put that in perspective, your average New York bank is in the realm between 600 and 800 kilowatt hours per. Deutsche Bank Frankfurt was in the realm of 600, is now after renovation, after going through renovation, lead platinum, still at 400. So 80 is pretty good. And that is with geothermal and with, you know, um, earth duct, slab heat activation, heating and cooling, but very important, LED lighting and good natural lighting qualities. At the Norddeutsche Landesbank we, be, we did, we were better with the natural lighting than here. We had 80 percentage of the life working hours a year natural lighting, not artificial lighting. Here we are in the realm of 60 percentage, maybe. It's the atrium. Now, we have one thing here I wanted to show you also. That's the outside terraces to the water. We have a double facade at this building. Now, double facades, double facades are often branded as sustainable facades. They are not really sustainable. All they do is more or less keep the wind off the sun shading devices. Have some passive, in a heating driven climate, some passive qualities or keep the noise out if you uh, if, if you are on a noisy street and you want to open the windows or you can get the air from be better quality air in there. Now here we have a double facade. We needed a double facade. It's a windy space. We needed efficient sun shading devices but mostly it's a harbor and a harbor is very a bad air quality because they constantly run their ship diesels for the cruise ships who are nearby because they don't get landlines, they run the ship diesels. The ship diesel still has 15 percentage sulfur in it. So it's bad air quality. And we needed to, to have operable windows to control the air quality. So we needed a double facade. And so we did here a double facade out of ETFE foil. This is not glass, this is foil has different advantages. It's very cheap, it's very light, and biggest advantage is it's not considered part of the building. That means if you have a fire, this melts directly away, disappears. So you don't have the smoke issue floor to floor you have normally with a regular double facade. And it's pretty cheap compared. The whole package, the outer and inner facade together, cost as much as a sophisticated single facade and is far more efficient. Hasn't it been never done before? Only in cushion form it had been done inflatable, but not as a single foil facade. And it was a good client. They were willing to take the risk.
Marco Polo Tower, right next to it. Same competition, same client, same developer. It's a luxury condominium tower. Hamburg Hafen City is a very interesting area. It is master planned in a way by the city. They sell the sites step piece by piece, but only small sites. No developer can have more than in about that size of a building. They cannot buy two or three sites. And then they have to go for design and permit and only af and they all act on letter of intent basis and only after they have permit they can and the city approves they can acquire, uh, acquire the site and then they have two months to start construction or the site falls back to the city so that's their way of quality control and interestingly developers like it because they have to come up very late in the game with cash by the property. This is the building. The form of the building I'll show you here comes. We have in average four apartments per floor. And each apartment should afford a view to the city and to the harbor. And each balcony should have some privacy and not look into the balcony below and that's when you get this odd form. And the top is bigger than the lower part for this simple reason. Top, more square meter and more euros per square meter. Very simple. And that gave us the alto vase form, you know. And here in the background you see the Herzog and de Moron Philharmonie. We were also hired to do, I think, four apartments, interior apartments. And it was interesting to work with clients where money is not really an object, you know, when you build it. It doesn't happen too often to, for architects. But we enjoyed that very much. And the lobby. And now, the house in house. This goes back to a competition my father had won before he retired. And it is this hall. It's a listed building. The original, it's the oldest stock exchange that exists. It's an ins it was an insurance exchange from the Hanse. And the building kind of goes back to, I don't know what, but 1700 something. Very old building. And had been remodeled several times. And they wanted more space in there, but it should respect the existing building. It actually shouldn't be there. But they wanted to dribble the space of the hall. And so that was a drawing from the competition. And it was all about transparency. Glass floors, everything was glass and transparent and so on. Now, once you start construction, you, you look at at fireproofing, you look at structure, you look the whole the whole area of the city is actually built on oak piles, so we couldn't go on the old foundations. We had to drill through, create new foundations. And in the whole complex, this and the city hall, which is next door, they have one server room. And this server room was right below that. Yeah? So in the water, so, uh, it's difficult. And the biggest part, because we could not touch the existing hall, the biggest part we could bring in through the doors you see here on the crane. Everything had to be in that size or smaller. So it was a challenge and we found out transparency doesn't really work. 
we have to change the idea, the concept to immateriality. And I'll show you what that means here. And that was the idea. The old and the new reflecting and com complementing each other. The new never ever in no way mimicking the old not using any element of the old and working with reflections and that's a view from below through the floors to the top what is the most immaterial thing we have we know it's light so we worked with light and we have designed that eight years ago we started design and we have designed it with LED lighting to at a time when LED lighting was not yet really on the market. The only, or the only place you saw LED my lighting was on keychains, you know, or laser pointer maybe. So we found a company, a friend of mine with whom we have developed lighting lamps and he was willing to take the risk. And what you see there, up there, are translucent LED panels up there. And we have all together 168,000 LEDs in this building. So it's all lit. It's, the LED lighting itself is only eight millimeters thick. And it's all translucent, all transparent, all immaterial. And on the top is a club. And it shows a little bit the idea here. To the left, we are on the old ceiling of the hall. There we took old furniture, seemingly old. We took an old chandelier. The same level next door in the new room. We also took similar elements, but in a very modern interpretation. The chandelier on the ceiling is LED, for example. So we took similar formal approaches, but in a very contemporary technical solution. And that's the whole building. And you see, it does respect, in a way, the historic hall. It is prominent in there, but it does not in any way tell the old how old it is or pretends to be better or special. And it's, after all, triple the floor plate of the old hall in the new element. Now, we are coming to another example. Ozeaneum in Stralsund. Again, a competition that my father originally had won before he retired and gave us to execute. Whilst at the Hamburg Haus im Haus, we had changed a lot because we noticed that transparency doesn't work. We made it far more technical. This building was almost a one-to-one -one built competition design. We didn't do much. We minimized the detailing. We kept it in a one to 500 scale, also in the execution. Stralsund is a UNESCO heritage, world heritage city. Now, here are the main buildings. And we are at the water at the harbor here. This is a competition design. Most people, it was in a competition. 40 participants, I would assume. And most people, because it's a brick area, it's a harbor area, 
big storage buildings in brick, said, okay, let's do a brick building. Let's do a brick aquarium. Now, aquariums by default didn't exist when brick was invented. So all the solutions looked like brick on steroids, way out of proportion. And there's another downside to it. An aquarium has to be dark because it's about you seeing the fish and not the fish seeing you. So the light level is from the, from the water to the spectator. That means no windows in the aquarium. Now, and that means if you use material like brick, huge brick volumes without windows. So what my father's office did was creating free forms. Again saying we should respect the grain, the scale of the city, but not necessarily the materiality. In here, the day of the opening. And you see what I meant with the scale of the buildings. The facade itself is steel. It's done by a wharf. It's a ship, ship body, like a big tanker, like up to an inch thick steel, and then painted white. Folded around a steel skeleton, and behind it all the Thermal insulation, everything is just gypsum. Gypsum board. And here's inside. It's very it's very rough. You go come in, then you take the escalator all the way up and then you walk your way through the building, through the four exhibition buildings down. That's the whale room. It's donated by Greenpeace. Okay. I would like to come, now we are traveling back to United States, Baltimore. What you see, the red dot, is where our site it is. Across the street is Penn Station, beautiful old train station. And we have here a very interesting client, very good client, University of Baltimore. It's a local university, started out as an evening school, became a university, and has a great president, Bob Bogolmoni, who took that project as his personal legacy. That's the project he wanted the university to have before he retires. And there's a f it's a funny little story. It was an RFQ process. And we are in there with partners with ASG out of Baltimore, AS St. Gross. And we were preparing for the presentation. And we had done sort of an analysis of the site and of the program, what could it be, yada, yada, yada. And they had prepared this, you know, Getty Pictures helmet, plan roles, on time, on budget, you know that. And I said, ah, let's, let's not do that, you know, I, it's, who cares, let's, let's go jump, let's cut it short. They gave us half an hour, let's do it in 15 minutes and then they can ask some questions and really focus and let's non-personalize it, make it up. No, no, they wanted to do it. So, they, we started the presentation, I introduced everybody, and then the first picture came, you know, on time, on budget, with the helmet. The president said, time out. Fifth presentation today. I've seen many helmets today. And so far, nobody had actually said, we are never on time and never on budget. 
So let's cut the crap here. I'm not interested. And then he said, do you have anything else to offer? And I said, yeah, well, it's, we are sort of thrown off the way, but give me five minutes. We rearrange the presentation we'll do. And then he said, OK, I have two questions for you, Stefan. How much of your time do I get? Valid question. I said, well, I should say no, all of my time. That's the project of my life, but that's nonsense. If, if we are all lucky, 20%. And then he said, second question is, why the hell do you want to build a project in Baltimore? And that was a very good question, because I actually didn't want to build a project in Baltimore. I was there the first time, and I thought, great, get me to the airport. <laughs> and then the second time, I was there and in the interview, and I wasn't convinced, but after the guy asked this question, I really thought about it and I said, okay, honest, let's be honest for one minute. Let's be honest. You have an absolutely impossible site. It's a freeway traffic island, inacceptable site, and there's not a single good building in a mile radius here, except the Penn Station. And that's a challenge, and that's how we got the job. And since then, we meet every six weeks and discuss architecture. He's one of the very few clients who is a non-architect, he is a lawyer by education, who goes in there and only discusses architecture, which I think is a great client, because you convince someone who argues about architecture and is willing to discuss it. But it's a challenge sometimes for the people in charge then. That's the situation. And these are DD renderings. The program is a library, law library, classrooms and offices, and the so-called clinics which is they consult people who cannot afford legal advice off the street, more or less, which is a very big part of the program. And in the competition, to the left, we had it all sorted out very clean. And then after talking to the president, he said, let's mix this stuff. I want the faculty and the students to meet more. Yeah? not to disappear all in their areas. Let's mix this stuff. And it came, made for a very interesting section because they have all different floor-to-floor -floor ceiling heights. And that is the section. And due to the fact that we have a rather high building and we have glass rooms in the eighth, ninth floor of 100 people, we cannot move them all the time up and down. Yeah? So we said we have a big schoolyard in the middle where people can spend time. So they only have to walk over three floors maximum, two to three floors. So it's easier to move the people between lectures. That's the atrium in the middle. And I'll go rather fast through. The floor plans. That's the student lounge. And here again, the whole building is only LED lighting. And this precedent was good. You know, there's always a discussion. Facilities people don't like LED lighting. And it took me a while to understand. Because for 20 years, you don't have to fix them. And they have a lot of staff who is actually there to change light bulbs. That is a problem. That's a discussion. So, uh, but the president understood that. LED lighting has various advantages. One is low energy, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is no toxic, minimal toxic waste. Fluorescent lighting is a lot of toxic waste. And LED lighting burns for 20 years. And then it's considered dead, 
meaning it is down to 75 percentage of its ca capacity, and that's considered dead. So, and it only has eight millimeters built-in height. So yeah, all advantages, and it's 24 volts, so it works also as em emergency lighting. And here, the president understood the potential to actually get donations for it, because it's so special still. The atrium. The facades, we have three different facades. This is the facade of the offices and the lecture rooms and so on. It's like a very thin layered double facade, like boxed windows. Because the whole building has operable windows. We have a geothermal well there. And natural ventilation and slab activation. That means slab cooling and heating in the concrete. So even for Europe, this is a pretty advanced building, even for Europe's European standards. This is the library facade. We had to close it by 75 percentage, but still wanted good daylight and visible contact to the outside. So it's a double, it's like a checkered board. And the top part is clear, every other field, because the top third of the facade is responsible for the quality of the daylight in the space, not the lower part, the top lower part. And the lower part is so when you stand, you can look outside. That's a rendering now. And here, these are photographs. The last project, and then I am through to, to show you, this is more about materials now, to show you the width of, of the work and approaches. Now, when we talk about sustainability, I, I have to come back to that. We always have to analyze the cultural, the geographical, topographical, and climatic background. The cultural background is very important. And one of the big problems of the international style was that we thought we could be, build everything everywhere on this planet the same way. And that was only possible because energy was so cheap to compensate with excess of energy for the shortfallings of architecture. And a truly sustainable building, which doesn't exist by default, but a more sustainable built environment will always be looking not for the technical solutions, but first for the architectural solution, for the place and the cultural background. So looking, we're building in Baltimore. Even though the building might look like a building you do in Germany, it's still a different culture. It's still a different climate. And it asks for different solutions than a little science, not a little, than a science building in Amherst, where you have a totally different climate, no urban context, a different culture, and different possibilities. Geneva, on the other hand, is, we are building there to the left, and that's what I show you, for the World Intellectual Property Organization, it's a United Nations organization for intellectual property, and to the right is the World Trade Organization we make for them, the security pyramid and the gardens and everything. Security pyramid meaning fence. But it shouldn't look like a fence. But I'll, I'll focus on the World Intellectual Property Organization. The Lake Geneva is a very fortunate landscape and situation. It's beautiful. The Place des Nations is here. You see Place des Nations, the first United Nations building. And to the right at the lake, the World Trade Organization building's WTO building is, is also an interesting 
building because it was the building of the first international organization ever, which was the unions. Their building, the international union organization, was the first international Okay, worldwide organization ever down there. World Intellectual Property Organization. We have built for them an administration building. Are now are, 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 are in the design process or under construction already for a conference center for a thousand people and an entry pavilion. And I'll Go. That's the administration building. Now, I was speaking about cultural context. In an international organization, it's very tough to find the cultural context. There are people of 140 different nations in these buildings, living and working together. They have eight official languages. Some people there work since 15 years together and have no common language, have to communicate with translators. Very weird. I thought English should do, doesn't do it. And so how do you design a culturally adequate building for all of them? Very difficult. There's, there's a gentleman from Greenland sitting next to a gentleman from Nigeria try to do a climate system for them. It's not easy. The expectations are different. So we worked with chilled ceilings. We have no operable windows, which I thought is idiotic in Geneva, but they insisted on a totally controllable internal climate. But they wouldn't do it again. We wouldn't do it again. That's the, the building itself. Also, only individual offices. They don't sit together in offices. Because people work according to political criteria together, not because they fit together or are good in a group together. It's all political. What is nice, it's very polite because the common denominator is politeness. But it's so overly polite that it's very difficult to work as an architect for them because you never get the truth until it's too late because everybody is so polite. They are even more polite, polite than you Americans. For me as a German, it's always tough over here to get it. Because everybody say, yeah, oh, it's, it's really nice, it's awesome, it's beautiful, it's, it's great. And I'm always waiting for the but, and no but comes. And here you'll never get a but. And in Germany, first the but comes. <laughs> in Germany, if someone, if people want feedback in the office from us, it's so funny. The cultural difference is here in the US, you have to tell. You know, it's great, it's beautiful, great job. Ah, oh, great job done. And when they work with us in Germany, they never get that. And then they say, what's going on here? And they say, okay, listen, you're in Germany now. You'll be the first one to hear if it's not good. And that's the cultural difference. So it's very hard for us to adjust. I'm coming here now. the The last project I show it's the it's the uh, conference hall for thousand people. Because the administration building was the last regime, and then the general secretary changed, and he wanted a very sustainable building, and he wanted to make up of the short shortcomings. Actually, it's a pretty sustainable building after all, because we use the water circle of the of the lake 
a water tube of the lake for heating and cooling, so it's very efficient. And the lake is very deep and has a lot of stream, so we can do it. We don't, but we are given a gap of three degrees Celsius, water taking out and bringing back in, not to overheat the water. But it's, it's okay. It's compared to other buildings, still a very low energy building, but it could be better. And then we said, okay, at this building, we look at the total life cycle. We also look at the building materials. And so we designed a big conference center for 1,000 people, conference all, all out of wood. Complete wood, everything wood. With, with a hall for 1,000 people, that's not easy. But or structurally, everything only wood. That's the view out of the window of the conference hall. It is a beautiful view. You see the lake, you see the mountains, and you see the Mont Blanc. It's built next to the existing building, another existing building from the 70s. And one of the reasons for the wood is also the weight, because we built on top of an existing parking garage. So we have only limited weight. The entries in the hall, that's the lobbies. The outside is shingles, wood shingles, and a tin roof more or less. And the fence is, yeah, we have developed that fence as well for them, the security perimeter. And that's the inside of the hall. And the inside of the hall, we designed the tables and the chairs and everything. Not because we wanted to design them, but because we found out if we can, if we take off the rack furniture, we lose more than 100 seating spaces. So if we are able to save two centimeters in the chair back, we get 100 more people in the room, 80 something more people in the room. So we design off and left that, and what you see are these balls at the ceilings, these Sputniks up there. They are big LED lights, chandeliers, big lights, 2 meter 20 in diameter, and they house the projectors, the loudspeakers, and everything in there. And we have developed those with Zoom Topel together. And this is the welcome center. It's also done in wood. We wanted to do it in fiberglass first, because here is a challenge. It needs to be a building that actually flies off in bomb blast security, so less people get hurt. If the building takes off, it has to be very light. But then our people spoke with um, Wharf at, Geneva, at the Lake Geneva, who do the Alingic yachts, you know, the race yachts, and fiberglass was not affordable. It was too expensive. So now it's a plywood structure. I hope I was able to show you a little bit the field in which we are working and our approach, and I hope it was understandable was clear. A sustainable approach is every time, every building, a very different approach. Thank you very much for your time.